The goal of putting someone in prison is to protect the public from that person. Rehabilitating the inmate is what we want to happen, but there are just some criminals who should have never been released. I've already brought you five cases like this, but I'm going to tell you about five more people who were released from prison and killed again. This is Monsters. David Edward Most spent time in a psychiatric hospital when he was only nine years old. His mother claimed that he had set his brother's bed on fire and that he had tried to drown him. A social worker said that the mother herself was disturbed, psychotic, and narcissistic, so it's not clear if the claims about her son were true. When questioned further about her son's behavior, she couldn't really give details and it's believed that she just didn't want him at home. At 18 years old, David enlisted in the United States Army and was sent to Frankfurt, Germany in 1972. In 1974, he killed 13-year-old James McClister, an American boy who was the son of expatriates and was court-martialed. He was convicted of involuntary manslaughter because he claimed the death was the result of a moped accident and he spent three years in Fort Leavenworth prison. In 1981, David set out to find and kill the man who had molested him when he was living in a children's home in Illinois, but he was unable to find him. Instead, he saw a 15-year-old boy, Donald Jones, and drowned him in a nearby quarry. He then traveled to Texas where he stabbed a 14-year-old boy who managed to survive. He was arrested for the stabbing and sentenced to five years in prison but the following year he was extradited to Illinois to stand trial for murder. He pleaded guilty to the crime and was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Even with his extensive and violent record, he was released in 1999 for good behavior. Most himself knew that he was a danger to society and wrote a five-page letter to the Illinois Department of Corrections asking to not be released from prison. He later said, quote, when I got locked up in the army, and then especially when I got locked up in 1981, I knew I should never be let out again. I didn't know how to act around other people, and I was never taught how to make friends and keep them. When an inmate says he doesn't want out, I hope that someone listens. They didn't listen. After his release, he killed three more teenage boys. Their bodies were found wrapped in plastic and encased in concrete in his basement. He pleaded guilty to all three crimes and was given three life sentences. In 2006, David committed suicide by hanging himself in his cell. Daniel Hiddle was adopted as a baby by Henry and Margaret Hiddle. Not much is known about his childhood, but he was a violent person from a young age. In 1973, when Daniel was only 23 years old, he noticed that his adoptive parent's dog had scratched his truck. He went inside and began arguing with Margaret about it, threatening to shoot her. When she called his bluff and said he didn't have the courage to do it, Daniel grabbed his shotgun and killed her. When Henry heard the shot, he reached for his rifle, but Daniel killed him before he could get to it. I couldn't find any information about whether or not he harmed the dog. I knew you'd ask. He pleaded guilty to two counts of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was released on parole in 1984, just 11 years after the brutal murder of his adoptive parents. After his release, he moved to Garland, Texas, where he picked up the drug habit he had before going to prison. In 1989, Daniel got into an argument with his wife and took off in his pickup truck. Before he left, he grabbed his shotgun, and we all know having an angry felon with a firearm driving around could only lead to something good, right? 
Well, he was pulled over for speeding by patrol officer Gerald Walker, and as the officer approached the vehicle, Daniel shot him in the chest with the shotgun and sped off. He then went to the home of his drug dealer, Mary Gross, who he had recently had a dispute with and killed her. He proceeded to kill all of the occupants in the house, 36-year-old Richard Cook, 19-year-old Raymond Gregg, and Mary's 4-year-old daughter, Christy. He attempted to flee the area, but crashed his truck. An off-duty firefighter had seen Daniel shoot Officer Walker and had notified the police, so they were on top of him fairly quickly. Daniel engaged in a firefight with officers until he ran out of ammo and surrendered. When first responders arrived at the house, they found Christy still alive and rushed her to the hospital. Though she was alive, she was determined to be brain dead and her family agreed to take her off life support and donate her organs. Daniel was arrested and only tried for the murder of Officer Walker, for which he received the death penalty. He was executed on December 6, 2000. John Lawrence Miller was an absolute monster whose first murder was just to see how it felt. John was already in trouble at only 15 years old. He was convicted of auto theft and sent to a reform school. On November 11, 1957, his parents went to the school and were allowed to take John home for a weekend visit. That evening, John slipped out of the house and disappeared. John lured 22-month-old Laura Wetzel into a house where he beat her to death. Her body was discovered the following morning, but by that time, John had fled and managed to make it to Reno, Nevada. He was caught in a stolen car in Reno and arrested. Back in California, he would confess to the crime, saying, quote, I wanted to know how it would feel, but I'm sorry about it now, of course. He was convicted of the murder and spent 17 years in prison, but was released on parole in 1975. While in prison, John had explained that he always thought about killing his father, but didn't because then there would be no money coming into the household. Just two months after his release, John arrived at his parents' house and shot them both. His father survived long enough to reach a neighbor's house so they could call 911. John stole a car at gunpoint and abandoned it in a parking lot before attempting to rob a bank. He was arrested and given two life sentences. He is currently serving his time at Pleasant Valley State Prison. Philip Jablonski's story of killing again has a bit of a twist. Philip joined the United States Army after high school and was sent to Vietnam. When he returned, he married his high school girlfriend and she quickly realized that he was a violent man. He would regularly strangle her until she passed out. She eventually left him and he went on to have multiple girlfriends that he would continually physically abuse and rape. In 1972, Philip raped a woman at knife point, but she managed to get away and run to a neighbor's house. Philip was arrested and convicted of rape, but was released not long after. It wasn't long before Philip was in another relationship. He moved in with Linda Kimball, and the two had a child together in 1977. In 1978, Philip attempted to rape Linda's mother, and though she didn't report it, Linda left him over it and took their daughter in the process. A few days later, when Linda returned to their apartment to pick up belongings, Philip beat, stabbed, and strangled her. He was convicted of murder and sent to prison. In 1982, while in prison, a woman named Carol Spadoni met Philip through a newspaper ad. Inmates were allowed to place ads in the newspaper in an effort to find pen pals, and Carol responded to Philip's ad. Despite the fact that Philip was serving time for murdering his previous partner, the couple got married the same year. They spent years living as a married couple with Philip behind bars. Even though he had tried to strangle his own mother with a shoelace during a visit in 1985, Philip was released on parole in 1990 after serving only 12 years for murder. Philip started attending a community college as part of the terms of his parole. On April 22, 1991, Philip raped and murdered a woman who was also attending the college. He carved the words, I love Jesus, into her back and left her body in a ditch. 
The following day, he shot, stabbed, and suffocated Carol. Who could have seen that coming? Then he raped and killed her mother before fleeing the state. On the 27th, he raped and shot a woman who owned a convenience store in Utah while he was headed east across the U.S. He was arrested the following day in Kansas and given the death penalty. He died in his cell in December of 2019. In 1996, then 16-year-old Travis Lewis was burglarizing a home in Horseshoe Lake, Arkansas, when he was surprised by two people, 75-year-old Sally Snowden McKay, the homeowner, and her nephew, 52-year-old Lee Baker, entered the home and caught Travis in the act. Travis fatally shot the two, and since Lee was a popular Memphis blues guitarist, the crime got a lot of publicity. Travis pleaded guilty to the crimes and was sentenced to 28 and a half years in prison. After the murders, Sally's daughter, Martha McKay, took over the historic property known as the Snowden House and operated it as a bed and breakfast. She hosted parties, reunions, weddings, and other events. The evil events that happened in the home in 1996 were soon overshadowed by laughter and enjoyment. While Travis was in prison, Martha had befriended him and as a long-time Buddhist, she wanted to offer him forgiveness. Once a connection was established, the two remained in contact and when Travis was paroled in 2018, Martha continued to offer her support, even giving him a job on the property. Travis's own mother warned Martha that he was going back to his old ways, and after money ended up missing from the house, Travis was fired. On March 25, 2020, Martha's body was discovered, stabbed, and bludgeoned to death in the house, and when police arrived, they found a suspect in the house who fled. The man jumped out of a window and tried to flee in his car, but it got stuck. He abandoned the car and dove into the lake, and authorities surrounded it, but he never resurfaced. His body was later recovered by search and rescue. When they identified the attacker, they were shocked to discover it was Travis Lewis, the same man that had killed Martha's mother and cousin 14 years earlier. There would be no answers as to why Travis murdered the woman who had forgiven him, but evidence at the scene suggested he was trying to steal from the house and may have been caught by Martha, causing her to suffer the same fate as her mother and cousin had. Sometimes it's due to new bills being introduced to help alleviate the problem with prison overcrowding, and others it's just plain oversight. But there are some people who have shown that they do not belong outside of prison walls. These monsters should have spent the rest of their lives behind bars. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can also check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our new merch at Teespring. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.